Welcome to the Medical Mnemonist Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, take a journey into the top techniques for medical mnemonics, study skills, board exam tips, and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Welcome back, lifelong learners. I have an interesting topic today. I noticed after the recently posted Seven Habits of Highly Effective Med Students episode, there was a lot of interest in that topic, at least from some of the social media accounts. So I thought I'd do a few more episodes like this over the next coming weeks. And today, one of the topics I want to cover is kind of the distinction between fun and motivation when studying and how to really increase your motivation. I know it's something I have a lot of trouble with sometimes, despite studying all of this for as long as I have. All of the motivation studies I did in my graduate research for the educational psychology degree and motivation during med school and now during COVID, it's very difficult. So here are some tips and research for this topic to really increase your motivation and kind of know what we actually mean when we're discussing motivation. But first, I do want to reach out to you, the audience, the listeners, and just kind of ask, how do you like the episodes going on so far? I'd love some advice if you might be interested in coming on the show and explaining some of the tips that you have used from the show that have benefited you, how it's helped you. If you have any guest ideas that might be good to interview, please send them our way. You can send them to medicalnemonist at gmail.com or hit me up on any social media, either personally at Chase DeMarco on any social media platform or find a rotation, which is also on all social media. So really, when we're discussing how to study and how to stay motivated to study for long periods of time, there are a couple of interesting debates going on as far as should it be fun or should it be serious? How can we increase motivation? What do we mean by motivation? And I've had some interesting debates on past episodes of this show as well, such as with my friend Anthony Metivier from the Magnetic Memory Method. He's been on a few times, and one of the more recent interviews, he was really saying that fun can be sort of detrimental, I guess, to motivation. That could kind of coincide with an interview we did a long time ago with the late Dr. K. Anders Ericsson on deliberate practice, saying that learning isn't fun, learning shouldn't be fun. If you're having fun, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. And that was part of his theory of deliberate practice, which we've covered several times in past episodes. I love deliberate practice in general, and I don't want to go against anything that he has stated or that his research has demonstrated, and a lot of research can have some parts that contradict each other, or you're looking at different endpoints, so I'm not going to say this is a contradiction. I do think that there are some interesting ways to add motivation through making it fun, through gamification, for instance, which is another topic we've probably had six or seven episodes on now. Definitely go back and check out some of those episodes if you have not yet. So there are a couple of studies that I would like to cover in today's episode as well, and this is not a literature review. These studies were pretty much Google searched, go to scholarly papers, find some on topics of motivation for medical students. And really pick those that were cited a lot, hoping that those would be some of the more robust studies in order to give a general overview of types of motivation and how to influence it and what the research says. So some of them might not even be U.S. populations. So take those into consideration when listening to these theories and these research papers. And there are a ton of theories out there when it comes to motivation. There's achievement emotions, achievement goals theory, expectation value theory, goal setting, implicit theories, need for achievement, self-affirmation, and tons of others. We're not going to go into the weeds of all of these different theories, but I did find one paper that I thought summed up these many, many theories into a couple of categories very well. And in particular, there are three categories that I felt really stood out. So those are regarding competence, regarding value, and then regarding control. And here's what I mean by that. The first one is the beliefs about competence. And this is really the student or learner asking, can I do this? Do I have the ability? Do I have the self-confidence to do this, to do it correctly, or to the degree that is necessary? 
The second one's regarding value. And that's, do I really want to do this? What's going to happen if I do it? Is it worth my time? And that can play a huge part in your motivation, especially for certain tasks. You might have strong motivation to pass your degree, but very small or very low motivation for this particular assignment that you just don't have much interest in. And the third one is the attribution of control. And this is really the perception that a learner has that certain underlying causes are within their control. They're changeable and they have control over this. And this really helps them to persist in the face of failure, especially. If you think that there's absolutely nothing you can do to change your grade because the teacher's out to get you, or they're telling you to study this material and testing you on this material, well, your motivation's going to go down. You don't see the points in it anymore because it's not under your control. So with those three general categories, there are some interesting studies specifically for medical education as well. And the first one I want to cover is going to delve into the intrinsic versus extrinsic values or motivations, and that's called Factors Associated with Motivation in Medical School, a Path Analysis. What this basically states is there are many, many different factors that play a part in our intrinsic motivation, or that that we hold within, without outside value, without outside reward. It's something that we just like to do, that intrinsic, internal nature of it. And then there's extrinsic value, which is usually for some type of reward, whether that be financial, some sort of token, some sort of reward, the degree that you're going for, the grade you're going for. Those are usually going to be extrinsic motivators. And the thing is, a lot of these motivating factors are outside of our control. They're unmanipulable variables, as this research quotes it. And that could be something like age or gender or ethnicity. And these do play a part in our motivation. They influence the way we view certain tasks and our interest in them. And then there are manipulatable variables such as autonomy and competency and relatedness to material. So those are things that we actually can have some control over or the instructor can give us control over, for instance. Now, the interesting part about this study was when it was looking at the different quantities of these variables and the different qualities of the variables for both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, it noticed a couple of commonalities, we'll say, a couple of correlations that we should be aware of. So qualities like perseverance, self-regulation, social intelligence, and hope have some strong correlations to classroom behavior. What exactly that means, the research in that paper didn't seem to be incredibly clear, but that classroom behavior is probably associated with some extrinsic or intrinsic motivations, and that could be useful to note. Do you have high hope in what's going on in your classroom or what your goals are? Can you persevere past all of the trials and tribulations that you're going to come across? Definitely good to note these qualities in yourself and maybe think of ways to improve them if you think yours are low. One of the highest extrinsic motivation factors, interestingly, seem to be high school GPA. Why this is exactly it's hard to say, but the theory kind of goes along the lines of if you studied really hard in high school, you're going for an extrinsic value. There's probably not a lot of intrinsic value to doing well in high school for most students. So you're going for something that's high achieving. You're trying to go for something that's going to bring you some sort of external reward or credibility. However, for intrinsic motivation, it was very different. Positive personality traits were associated with very high intrinsic motivation. But in this particular study, the one variable that contributed the most to intrinsic motivation was family support. Not peer support, not friend support, but family support. So very interesting how your support system and something that might be out of your control can play a very influential role on your motivation. Okay, so we've kind of discussed these three categories, these three buckets of competence and values and the attributions of control. And we've discussed some of the personality traits that can affect the intrinsic and extrinsic motivations within these categories as well. But we should probably take a moment just to go over some of the ways that you can actually make a change yourself. Because if it's out of your control, then it's out of your control. And there's no sense worrying about it. But extrinsic motivations especially 
can really benefit from common topics we've discussed in past episodes, such as habit formation. Sometimes decreasing a barrier to take an action can really help increase the potential to form a new good habit. And that good habit can help you reach your extrinsic goals, whether that be GPA, board exam scores, or some other factor that's extrinsic. We actually discussed habits a bit more in the past episode, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Students, so I would recommend going back to that for a few more tips and advice. Intrinsic motivation is a little more difficult because it's sometimes difficult to find a personal desire or enjoyment in something just for the sake of it. But there are some practices that can do this to some degree, at least, in, in certain realms. Whether they correlate directly to your schoolwork is really going to depend on many other factors. But things like self-compassion, gratitude practices, journaling, those can sometimes raise your intrinsic motivation in the aspect that they make you more aware and empathetic and enjoying and really notice value in things that you might not have noticed the value was there before. Now that you notice more value in a person or a topic or a subject or an activity, well, that can help benefit and boost your intrinsic motivation. So I do recommend adding some of these practices to your daily or weekly routine so that you can work to better yourself in many ways. Another study that I came across that I found quite interesting is called The Importance of Students' Motivation for Their Academic Achievement. And basically what this does is it goes over some of the different motivations and how it actually plays a part in their grades, in their academic success in total. And though things like students' IQ and prior grades, as was mentioned in the last study that we talked about, and even past achievements can boost their motivation, they were relatively small in comparison to one other factor. And that factor was self-concept. So it seems like the motivation of students for their academic success can really be influenced heavily, heavily, heavily by their self-confidence, their abilities, how they perceive their abilities to succeed, to complete this project, to do well on it. And the interesting thing is, this is something that is under our control. Our self-perceptions are completely under our control. We can't affect other people's perceptions of ourselves, but we can affect the perceptions we hold of ourselves. So a little homework for you this week is find out what exactly it is that motivates you, that drives you. Write them down in a journal. Write them somewhere that you can keep yourself honest and assess these factors later because they will change over time. Find a few resources, whether this be workbooks or other podcasts specifically discussing these topics. And explore meditation, gratitude practice, whatever it is that is going to help you become more aware and accepting of your current situation, of yourself, and really change and influence your perceptions of the world around you. I know it sounds a little woo-woo, but there's an amazing amount of research demonstrating just how much we impact ourselves. And the whole aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy is really based on these concepts. So even pick up a book in that and try out some of the different methods and tools that they have in those books. You can definitely find these for free at your local library, possibly your school library. Tons and tons of podcasts about all of these, about all of these topics. And there are some good workbooks for $10, $15 on Amazon. Sometimes just listening to something is not going to be enough. We actually have to go through the process, go through the workbook ourselves in order to make the change that we need. But all of these different changes are going to influence our academic success. They're going to make us better students, but they're also going to make us better outside of the classroom. So I think these are very good skills to start to develop and continue to develop throughout your life. It's a constant process. We're constantly remodeling how we think, how we act, the friends we have, the scenarios we're in. And every different scenario is going to come with different challenges. So... I do recommend putting some of these to use, listening to others that have had issues with this and how they overcame it, generally on podcasts. Go through some actual exercises yourself, just in your spare time, maybe in some break time that you've pre-scheduled. And I think if you put just a little bit of time, once a week even, 
you're going to notice some benefits and really enjoy the outcome of it. So I hope you'll actually take the time to do so. Well, in future weeks, we're going to have some more episodes on productivity, on efficiency, on planning, and several other topics that really need to be addressed more in the medical sphere because our education system is not always the most efficient. And with the amount of information we have to cover, we need to learn to be more efficient on our own. So I hope you got some value from this episode. I hope it wasn't too woo-woo for you. And if you did like this episode or any past episodes, I would really appreciate any ratings and reviews that you might be willing to give. It's always appreciated. It shows others that there's value in this show. And I like reading them. It makes me feel special. So <laughs> I hope to see some more of them. And do reach out to me if you would like to come on the show or know anyone that might want to. Again, that's medicalnemonist at gmail. Or you can find me, Chase DeMarco, or Free Med Ed on any social media platform. And I'll see you next week. Have you been thinking about one-on-one -on -one training and tutoring at a reasonable price? Well, Prospective Doctor is now sponsoring a limited number of free sessions with me each month. To register, you can go to prospectivedoctor.com slash chase and register for a free 30-minute coaching session. If you decide that you want to use their MCAT or USMLE tutoring services, you can now use the code CHASE10 to receive 10% off of your first $400 spent. Just enter CHASE10 and get your discount now. The Medical Mnemonist Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including USMLE tutoring and residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.